So good morning, everyone. That's us just turned 10 o'clock, so we'll get kicked off with the webinar. And please let us know if you can't hear me clearly, but hopefully everything's running smoothly so far. So this is the first of a series of virtual business support forums that we'll be running through Team Burlington. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Team Burlington, we're a partnership between the Burlington Chamber of Commerce, Burlington Economic Development, the Burlington Downtown Business Association, Tourism Burlington, and Aldershot Village BIA. And so we come together on a regular basis to look at what are the business needs of our community and how can we coordinate and collaborate to support our businesses in the best way. And ever since we've seen the impacts on both the economy and our local businesses from the implications of the COVID-19 crisis, we've been working together on a daily basis to look at what are the needs of our community and how do we address that. And so that's meant um, one version of the truth, which is hosted through our Burlington Chambers website, where you can find all the up-to-date information that you need as a business on COVID-19 that we're hearing from both the federal and provincial levels and what that means for you. And so that's all of our partners collaborating together to get that information out to you on a daily basis, as well as this series of business forums and other activities that we'll be doing in the future. So thank you very much for submitting all your questions ahead of time that allowed us to go through the many, many questions that we got and kind of filter them down to the most frequently asked questions, theme those out and get the right speakers on the line to address those questions for you. So we'll be going through and asking our speakers uh, once we've done the introductions to do that. We did get a lot of questions in that were more focused on the provincial and federal level around the new wage subsidies, essential businesses, um, supports for retooling. We're doing another webinar on April 6th, which we will have our federal and provincial counterparts on who will be able to answer those questions much more cohesively and comprehensively. So we would suggest that you sign up for that webinar to get the answer to those questions because we'll be filtering those types of questions over to that webinar. So with that in mind, I'd like to welcome our panelists today. So we have Mayor Marianne Mead Ward from the City of Burlington, Tim Camiso, our City Manager for the City of Burlington, Heather McDonald, the Executive Director of Community Planning, Regulation and Mobility for the City of Burlington, Dr. Dale Kalita, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control for Joseph Brandt Hospital, and John Davidson, for executive, the Executive Director of Economic Development at Halton Region. So before we kick into the Q&A, I'd just like to pass over to our panelists to do a brief intro on themselves and kind of what they've seen from COVID-19 so far and uh, any thoughts on that. So Mayor Mar Marianne Meadward, would you like to kick that off? Oh, unmute, please. Thank you. <laughs> we'll get the hang of this. Uh, welcome to everyone who is watching and a special thanks to all of my uh, panel, pan fellow panelists uh, this morning. It's great to be with you. I uh, know these are very, very challenging times for all of us and especially for our business community. And I want you to know that the city is doing everything that we have within our uh, jurisdiction and within our toolkit to, uh, to be a support to our business community. And we'll talk about some of those later today. We don't know how long this is going to last. And you probably are aware that the city decided on Monday to uh, remain closed. Our parks, our facilities, we won't be permitting activities, uh, whether that's uh, sporting events or festivals in our uh, parks and facilities until the end of June. And that uh, decision was really a, a reflection of the fact that decisions have to be made now for activities that are months out. Contracts need to be signed, checks need to be written, and if your event is, is not going to happen and you're not going to have the revenue, uh, then you have to make the decision, uh, the toughest decision about whether to pull that. And uh, as business folks, uh, you are in the thick of that right now, and I know understand that timing. In terms of business closures, that window is really defined by the province, not by the municipality. And so, uh, so their timing is a little different. It's not quite till the end of, uh, of June, but for our purposes, uh, that's our time frame. And if we can get up and running sooner, uh, we certainly will. However, the, the reality of the situation is that we are not expecting to see the peak of cases in Halton Region, Ontario, and probably Canada for another two to three weeks. And so we're going to be living in this new reality for quite some time. 
we need to be prepared for that. And uh, finally, I just want to say thank you so much to all the businesses that uh, voluntarily closed before the orders that are doing everything you can if you're staying open to um, make sure that your employees are safe and respecting those social distancing, uh, physical distancing measures, and all of those uh, businesses that have offered to support the healthcare efforts in our community. We need you. We will continue to need you. And thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Mayor Meadward. And now if I could perhaps ask John Davidson uh, to talk a little bit about the region. And I'm sure some of our businesses may be aware, but we get this question a lot from both businesses and residents because they don't realize that we actually operate in a two tier system here. And so there is an economic development function at the region. And there's also a lot of business support mechanisms that go on at the region. So could you just briefly introduce yourself, John, and talk about what the region does from a business support perspective? Yes, thank you, Anita. Um, am I on the screen? I'm not sure whether you guys can see me or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I can't see myself, which is probably a great thing. Thanks, Anita, for the opportunity to be here this morning. And I really appreciate the efforts that uh, BDC and its partners, the Chamber, um, are putting together. So as Anita outlined, yes, we do have economic development at the regional level as well. So we do have two-tier government. Um, and as the, the mayor was, was outlining, you know, these are not our normal times, obviously, for everybody, and especially for the business community. Um, the impacts are, 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 are tremendous, and, and, and they could be long-lasting as well. Um, I do want to outline the fact that there are a number of services at the regional level which are ongoing. They're essential services. They include water and wastewater. They include regional road construction. All of that continues on. These are essential services. And of course, EMS, um, paramedics that is, and, and our public health department. So right outside my office are all the case managers who are working in public health, trying to um, understand the contact tracing and just there to make sure that our community is safe. So that's what they're working on 12 hours a day. So it's a very busy spot at the region in terms of the public health department and uh, COVID-19 is, is certainly impacting um, the delivery of our services, but we're doing the best that we can. And as, uh, as, as Anita outlined, we do have some business support services for um, the small business community in Burlington and across the region. Our small business team um, is, is there working remotely uh, as we speak. We have four small business consultants who will be happy to engage with any um, employer uh, in Burlington in terms of looking at some of their cash flow uh, needs um, to put them in touch just the same way that uh, Anita and her group might uh, in terms of some of the opportunities that are there at the federal and provincial level. But we do uh, roll up our sleeves and work with um, early stage entrepreneurs, with uh, small business owners to help them through these tough times. So I'd urge you to take a look at our um, website at halton.ca forward slash small business. Um, you can also call uh, email, email us at um, uh, small business at halton.ca uh, or reach out to us through um, our, our phone number as well. Uh, but those uh, those meetings are still taking place over Zoom, which has become uh, such a useful tool for all of us. And we can also do phone calls and phone call meetings as well. So we're also trying to keep our getting started business sessions going and other um, seminars that we typically provide during the year. Those are also taking place via Zoom. I did want to point out one other thing, I guess, in terms of some business supports. Um, I know Heather McDonald's on the line here from Community Planning. Um, the region as an external uh, commenting agency to the city of Burlington is keeping that flow of development applications going. That's really important for us to make sure that those wheels of development um, and planning are still in motion. And so that is still happening. Um, as well, our service uh, permits for uh, road construction, um, of course, are ongoing too. So there are services for contractors, developers, and small businesses that continue to be uh, ongoing. Uh, my final point would just be that um, Halton Regional Council met last week and of course Mayor Mead Ward was part of that, uh, our first virtual council meeting and I think it went pretty well, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is great to know that we can continue with council business during these um, uh, tra challenging times. Um, but importantly, uh, through, that, uh, through that council session, we have approved our 2020 tax policy report, which includes a reduction in industrial taxes um, which will affect approximately 300 plus uh, industrial concerns in the city of Burlington. So we are seeing the removal of approximately $5 million of regional tax burden um, coming off the uh, industrial uh, tax 
space as well. Um, so those are my uh, comments, Anita, this morning. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and maybe I'll just pass over to Heather quickly because she has a very long job title that people may not be familiar with. So maybe you could uh, share with everyone uh, what the Community Planning Regulation and Mobility Group does and kind of who sits under that as part of your role, Heather, for answering those questions. Yes, thank you, Anita, and good morning. Uh, yes, my uh, service area includes uh, community planning, which uh, includes development planning and policy planning. Uh, at the department, all, the uh, service area also includes transportation services, building and bylaw enforcement, and transit. So uh, a large service area, uh, all still very busy, making sure that we are providing the, the uh, necessary support for small businesses and the citizens of Burlington. Um, as John mentioned, uh, with respect to processing of development applications, I'll answer that question more fully, but uh, later on in the forum, but we are continuing to process development applications and building permit applications also we continue to do exterior um, inspections with respect to building permits and as much as we can interior inspections using um, technology and working very closely with the development industry on uh, contractors and builders to be able to do that um, through photographs and um, and emails. So we, we're keeping that process going um, and uh, there are some technology issues involved in that, but we are working to overcome those. Um, our municipal uh, bylaw enforcement officers focused very much on health and safety of our citizens. Um, and as of today, um, our municipal bylaw enforcement officers, um, including those in our transportation area, will be assisting the Halton Regional Police in uh, ensuring that people are not congregating. So responding, assisting Halton Regional Police in uh, responding to calls that we get uh, that indicate that there is congregation uh, continuing in different public areas and uh, also highlighting if there are businesses open that should not be. So that uh, effort begins today um, with a uh, concerted effort with the Halton Region Police and uh, our enforcement officers. So that's important to note. Um, and also our, of course, our transit services continue and uh, we, we continue to have some routes that are busier than what we may have thought, which suggests that people are still requiring transit to get to, to jobs uh, for essential services. And so we continue to be nimble and making sure that we've got uh, the right service level on the routes to ensure that people are able to move around as they need to, uh, to get to work. Um, and to also to get to grocery stores and drug stores, et cetera. So um, as I say, generally, the departments in my service area are very much focused on health and safety in this uh, period of time and are here to assist small business in any way we can. So please reach out. Our um, BIA coordinator is still uh, available if, uh, any of you require some assistance from her and uh, we have that information on our website that you can uh, get in touch with her. So um, I'll respond to some questions more fully uh, later on in the forum. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Heather. And so just in the interests of time, we're reaching almost 10.13 now. Um, so I think I'll switch it over to Carla Nell, uh, the President and CEO of our Chamber of Commerce, to kick off the Q&A period. And I think as part of that, we can ask uh, Dr. Dale and Tim Camiso to talk a little bit about their organization's approaches to this. Terrific. Thank you. Good morning, everyone who's listening in. Uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to be speaking with some of our tremendous community leaders at this time who are working so very, very hard 
and we're so grateful to all of you for your efforts. So um, as Anita mentioned, we did uh, call for questions as part of the registration process. So we've we've organized our questions this morning into a number of themes. And so our, our first question today is, is for our mayor and for our city manager. We know that the city has had Carla, you got muted there. Apologies. Um, thanks so much. Uh, as Anita mentioned earlier, we have um, we put out a call for questions as part of the registration process, and we do have a number of questions. Uh, I'd like to actually uh, direct our first question to the mayor and to our city manager. We know that that the city has had to go through the process of defining what is an essential versus non-essential service to be delivered. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the city has has defined, what has been defined as an essential service, and then specifically, is business support considered to be an essential service? All right, I'll let Tim jump in on that one first, and then uh, I'll add some comments. Maybe Tim, go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. So, um, yeah, so the first part of the question, and it's a great question, is we've gone through the process of really looking at all our departments and identifying, you know, particularly in relation to the health crisis, what services we need to continue. And we've broken those down into essential and kind of business critical. So certainly our frontline emergency services, our fire uh, department, uh, Heather mentioned transit, we consider that an essential service. We're also operating that free right now. So I think what we identified, I think, was that was um, a benefit, particularly given some of the, the, the routes that people are using more for business. Um, so we go through the whole organization and essentially say, what services do we really need to put in place to ensure the health and safety of the community? And then also, um, you know, really just to help facilitate whatever, you know, is happening in the, in the community and also be responsive to the region and particularly Joseph Brand Hospital. Because we, you know, the, the sad reality is we've st we're still in the planning uh, stages of, of the virus spread. We haven't quite hit the emergency, I think, as the mayor said. Um, so we are ready to really help the community, however, and put in place the support we need to do that. Uh, with respect to business support, I think what I would do is actually refer back to Anita's opening comments. Um, we do have Team Burlington and, and the organizations were outlined. The city considers itself a, a member of Team Burlington and we work closely with the organizations. So what we're looking to do really is support however we can through those organizations. I think we have, uh, you know, we, we have a relationship also with the downtown that I think is direct. We've eliminated all of our parking fees. We know that the downtown in particular has been hit hard given the nature of the businesses, restaurants, and you know, destination type uh, retail. So I think what I would take to view, and I can speak to some of the, the, the measures that we will be taking to council on the 20th. Um, we are, I would take the view in our first round of sort of trying to provide direct financial support, but whatever Team Burlington needs, we're in close contact with and will help facilitate that. So I'll leave it at that. I think I can, perhaps some part of my comments, just talk about what we are bringing to council on April the 20th. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mayor, is there anything you'd like to add? For sure. So uh, it, it's interesting in, uh, in, an, in an emergency that all governments are considered essential. <laughs> Uh, so, so wrap your head around that, but we, as Tim said, we are obviously having to look uh, at our line by line activity, just like businesses are, you know, we have revenue that's not coming in. Tim mentioned transit. That's about a 10 to $15,000 loss of revenue per day for us. We canceled our spring programming. That's huge loss of revenue uh, for us from permitting and uh, working with our community partners. So we're going to be looking on the 20th with all of council what uh, you know what projects can be delayed what projects can uh, have to proceed and so that's part of our essential uh, service conversation to the community 
the other thing that we are doing that we have direct ability to assist our businesses is through property tax relief. So on the 20th, there will be a uh, report coming forward that uh, that forgives any penalty or interest for not paying your April installment uh, and May installment, and that gets you to the end of May. And then we'll just evaluate that month to month. The, the region has kindly uh, also allowed us uh, for future payments not to pay them the one third roughly of taxes that is your tax bill and the province has done the same with education. So all levels of government, I would say throughout this emergency are working very well together, very collaboratively, putting any partisanship aside and uh, just as the businesses and the community would expect us to do. And thank you for speaking to the issue of property taxes. That's an area that we have received many, many questions about. So we certainly appreciate council's consideration uh, at the local level, as well as the regional and provincial government's involvement in providing that much needed relief to our members in the business community, as well as residents more broadly. So um, at this time, we actually wanted to utilize a tool that exists as part of the Zoom platform just to canvas those who are on the line and to gather a little bit of feedback from all of you. Um, we'd like you to, and I'm going to ask Shauna to display this on screen. We'd like you to answer the following question about what are some of the specific impacts that you as representatives of the business community are currently experiencing? So if you can just check all of the above that apply, uh, that'll certainly provide some very useful insight, not only to our local decision makers, but that we can also share with our provincial and federal counterparts when they speak to us on Monday, April 6th. So we'll ask everyone on the line just to take a moment and select each of the options that are shown on screen that are applicable to your operations. Um, maybe while everyone takes the time to fill that out, we can move on to the uh, next set of questions. Um, so our next kind of theme of questions was around kind of permitting and, you know, regulation processes for business. So these will be mostly directed to Heather. Uh, so one of the questions we got most frequently was, will zoning ease off for some of the small businesses needing to promote themselves out there? as they can find it a little bit difficult to get through some of these processes in terms of parking, signage, different things like that. Yes, and uh, so we do recognize the significant challenges that small businesses are facing right now as in, we all are in these difficult times. Um, and yes, we are, we are really only focusing our enforcement on um, matters of health and safety. Uh, so with respect to, there were some specific questions around how we are enforcing things such as signage and parking. Um, and so I can tell you that with respect to signage, uh, we are not removing any signs uh, that are advertising small business, whether they're on private or public property. Um, and we will uh, not be doing that. We want to encourage uh, people to be using the businesses uh, that are able to be open for takeout or, or uh, whatever. Um, so that I can assure you that we are not enforcing the sign bylaw in the way that we would normally be. Um, with respect to parking, uh, we are not uh, enforcing time limits or overnight parking. As uh, Tim mentioned, we're allowing for free parking uh, in areas that are in normal times uh, require paid parking. What we will continue to enforce is um, parking that's being done illegally in uh, fire routes um, or no stopping areas where it's important to keep the, the area clear. Um, so we 
those will be the only kind of parking enforcement that we'll continue to do. So as I mentioned, we generally are um, just in doing enforcement where it comes to uh, ensuring health and safety of our citizens and uh, recognizing that we need to um, not be enforcing some not essential uh, matters. Great. And the other frequently asked question that we got from businesses was what are we ha is happening right now with respect to development application reviews and circulations? So are those being um, accepted for new submissions? And then what's happening with the existing ones? Okay, so any application that we had received before City Hall uh, closed, we uh, continue to process those applications. Our staff for the most part are working from home and doing uh, the best they can with the technology that's available to be able to continue to process those applications. Uh, and with respect to building permits in particular, we continue to process those building permits and carry out inspections as I'd indicated earlier. So that continues on. Uh, with respect to new applications and resubmissions, at this point in time, we are not uh, able to accept applications, uh, and we, but we have a team uh, dedicated to looking into uh, logistics and technology that we could employ to allow us to, in fact, accept and process new applications. Uh, and we are working very hard at that and hope within the next week to be able to indicate how we might be able to uh, continue to accept applications and move forward. Um, so we've got some challenges in, in how to do that, but we are working hard to overcome them. Great. Thanks so much, Heather. And so now we'll move to another quick poll question. So that should be coming up on the screen, hopefully, as we work through the first few kinks with our first webinar here. Uh, so I don't see it coming up on the screen. So maybe we'll move on to more questions with Carla. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're very, very fortunate to have Dr. Kalina joining us today from Joseph Brandt Hospital. Um, certainly, we're delighted to have you with us, particularly given your expertise in infectious disease. So we've received so many questions from employers, uh, essential businesses who are continuing to operate because of their very nature. And can you provide us with some insight about best practices and recommendations to really ensure the safety and, and to protect employees in those, in those key sectors? Thanks, Carla. Uh, I'm First, I did, I did want to say thank you as well for um, asking me to participate. I'm very happy to help out um, in any way that I can, uh, as are we all at Joe Branch as well. Um, I recognize that a lot of the focus around essential workers, I think especially in the media, has been around essential healthcare workers. And of course, as the Infection Prevention and Control Medical Director at Joseph Brandt, that's been a lot of my focus as well. But I recognize as well that there are a lot of other essential workers, uh, not only within Burlington, but across the country as well. And it's important to try to keep as many people safe and healthy as possible. And I think that there's a few ways that we can help to support doing uh, things like that. So firstly, maybe a few resources actually that will be helpful for people. On the Canada Public Health website, uh, which can actually be accessed through Canada.ca, there's actually a really great tool that starts as a web bot, uh, so um, just as a, a chat mechanism that can help direct you to some of the some of the more specific questions, but actually also directs you to workplace safety um, guidelines as well. Uh, there's also very similar guidance that's on the Ontario.ca website as well. So all of those will will really help. Uh, I think individual businesses with some of the more intricate questions. But on a general statement, it is important that we're ensuring the safety and the health of all of our employees. Um, for a lot uh, of employees, it is difficult to maintain that two meter or six foot distance. And I recognize that. It's actually one of the reasons why uh, every 
uh, staff member at Joe Brandt Hospital right now is actually wearing a mask. And that's because that helps re reduce the spread of the virus from you to other people. Um, the need to wear a mask all the time in public is really uh, up to one's discretion. There's not a lot of really great evidence to suggest that it helps protect you uh, from contracting the virus, but it does help prevent spreading the virus to other people, which is what has uh, colored our policies. But it is important as much as possible to try to maintain a safe distance away from people. If that can't be done, putting some sort of a barrier is always helpful. I know that a lot of people would have seen the news just like I did over the course of the past few days about companies that are creating glass and plexiglass screens uh, to help prevent their employees from getting face to face with other individuals as well. I'm gonna close something here. Um, but, and these are all ways that can help protect our employees and our customers as well when we are providing essential services. The other thing that I think that's important to do also reflects back on a practice that we're using at Joseph Brand Hospital, and that's something that we call active screening. And what that looks like is actively asking everybody on the first day or sorry whenever they're coming into work whether they have any symptoms of the virus so that will be questions like are do you have a cough a fever a runny nose and might even extend to uh questions like are you feeling nauseated do you have any diarrhea uh or as we're seeing nowadays uh, do you have a loss of a sense of smell uh, so you know there's there's more things that we're learning about the virus but it's really asking questions of the employee and sometimes of your uh, customers as well, uh, whether you have any symptoms, because we find that when confronted with a question like that, people are more likely to reflect on any symptoms that they might be having and are less likely to transmit it. If people fail that question, so if they uh, do think they have any symptoms, it's always important if you do have any masks available, they should be wearing a mask because again, uh, that would reduce that risk of them spreading the virus to other people. But then the next stage really is uh, going to an online self-assessment. So that can either be accessed through Ontario.ca or also Canada.ca um, or calling public health. So that's 311. So we're hearing a lot about, you know, a shortage of personal protection equipment. Can I ask, does a non-medical grade mask help? Is that something as a practice that, that can be useful or that we should be implementing and adopting? Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. And what I'll comment on first is the shortage of personal protective equipment. So at Joseph Brand Hospital, we do have an adequate supply of personal protective equipment. And the important point to that is that we, uh, although supply chains have been severely limited and disrupted, especially because of the locations of the outbreaks, especially in China uh, and in Italy, where interestingly a lot of our products have come from, mm -hmm. um, we have been able to maintain our supply chain as of yet. Uh, we're, we're always a little bit worried and a little bit anxious about keeping those supply chains open. Um, and to that end, I will say as well, uh, if anybody that's on the call right now does have access to personal protective equipment or has questions about donations, um, you can contact the hospital. I'll give you an email address and I'll put it in the chat as well, but it's COVID donations, C-O-V-I-D-D-O-N-A-T-I-O-N-S at josephbrandhospital.ca. Again, I'll put that in the chat in a minute. But the other important point that, uh, Carla, you raised is non-medical grade masks. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of, um, of people reaching out about uh, making their own homemade masks. And it's very kind. But at the end of the day, we also know that masks that are made out of cotton, masks that are made out of fabrics and things like that, are actually not particularly good at filtering the virus. They only filter the virus to around about 40 to 70%. Whereas a medical grade mask that's produced for that purpose filters around 90 to 95% of those virus particles. And the worry that we have about that is that when people wear a, a, a homemade mask or a fabric based mask, there's a false sense of security and people get a lot closer than they really should um, without that protection. So there's actually evidence to suggest that when you're wearing that mask, although there might be a little bit of a benefit, 
because of those risks of getting closer to people, you actually increase the risk of getting the virus by wearing a mask like that. Um, so we really do appreciate um, the, the people that have been reaching out. And one of the things we've been trying to do at Joe Brandt over the course of the past week is actually source more appropriate materials to make some of those masks. Um, it's an ongoing effort. It's been very difficult to source things like that. Um, and also a bit of a, uh, a new adventure for us, I think. I've never done that before. Uh, but, um, but I'll update uh, our COVID team and, and that's the, the best avenue to again, access those sorts of uh, fabrics uh, or materials to make that. And again, I'll put that uh, email address in our, in our chat. Thank you. And, and certainly, you know, Team Burlington will continue to share information and insights from you and your colleagues with the business community in Burlington. And so I think the, you know, the key takeaway here is that physical dis distancing is the best defense at this stage. Uh, one quick follow up. How effective are those plastic screens that we're seeing in terms of protecting employees as well as others who may need to interact with them to purchase groceries or other essentials. Is that, is that a good defense mechanism as well? They are helpful. We're actually using some of those screens. I think they're actually going up today at Joe Brandt, as a matter of fact. They are helpful. Um, and because we know that the virus is spread through what we call droplets, um, so we've all seen those gross pictures of people sneezing into the sun and things and that spray of, of droplets. It's disgusting, but it also gives a really great idea of what those droplets are. So those droplets do get launched into the air, but they fall and they fall within about that two meter uh, distance that we ask people to maintain away from each other. And so the virus really does get spread uh, like uh, through droplets that come from coughing and come from sneezes, not just through the air, and it doesn't mean it doesn't stay in the air, which is one of the big differences between something like this virus and another virus like measles, for instance. So putting up those screens helps with decreasing the risk of spreading those droplets, uh, even through talking or if there's any coughs or anything like that. But as you, as you said, Carla, the best defense really is to try to maintain that six uh, foot distance, that two meter distance. If you are feeling unwell, um, certainly uh, wearing a mask if you need to go out in public. Realistically, if you're feeling unwell, you should stay put. Hey. Think, there's a lot of resources, both from um, delivery of, pharma uh, of, of medications uh, to delivery of groceries and things like that, that I know have been very um, helpful uh, from the business community and we're really appreciative of to help keep those people at home. If you have a cough, cough into your shoulder. If you have a sneeze, wash your hands after as well. Um, and, uh, and maybe just another point, we have had a lot of responses from uh, the business community about donations to Joe Brandt. Um, and I, I can't thank you guys enough. I think that the support that we've had from the entire community has been uh, certainly felt uh, with us and Joe Brandt. I know that we saw, I saw a Twitter post yesterday about, um, uh, about a brewing company who I think donated uh, cards to Joe Brandt, uh, which, which is very kind. And I think being able to support the entire community at a time like this is something that we really do appreciate and we felt it at Joe Brandt. Well, thank you for that comment. We are, we are certainly all very much in this together and, and we're seeing the business community, you know, rally around one another and, so many incredible leaders are emerging and, and supporting, uh, you know, partnerships and, and those in need across the city. So it's uh, central to who we are in Burlington for sure. Sure. So, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Anita. Thank you, thank you so much. Right, and uh, just on that, I'm gonna do a little bit of a follow-up question to Heather, because we were talking about health and safety there. So. Heather, maybe you could talk about some of the uh, new precautions that have been put in place for those employees that are coming in via Burlington Transit to make sure that everyone stays safe. Yes, thanks, Anita. Uh, so we have put, uh, we we have now all the boarding is being done from uh, the rear uh, doors of the buses to um, minimize contact with the drivers. Uh, and that's been allowed by not having fares uh, being collected. We also have um, the, the seats that are immediately adjacent to the drivers have 
been uh, bungee cord off uh, so that people are not sitting in proximity to the drivers. Uh, so it's really limiting that um, uh, interaction with the drivers and proximity to them. That And, and we are uh, also putting up uh, the plexiglass screens uh, to also protect them. Um, and we have allowed drivers, if they wish, um, to wear masks. We're not requiring that, but if they wish to do so, um, that, that's certainly allowed. So we have been taking uh, precautions for both our drivers uh, and our passengers. Great, thank you, Heather. So uh, moving on to kind of our next theme set of questions, which were really around kind of uh, decisions by the city and city budget. So we talked this a little bit earlier, but if Mayor Mead Ward or Tim wanted to add anything to this, one of the questions we got was, um, why are so many things being preemptively closed by the city for months when we don't actually have a long-term handle on this? And certainly that decision was made earlier this week by our city, but it's actually been followed by multiple of our cities now. So was there anything you wanted to add to the comments you made earlier around planning cycles and making sure that we get this right for our community? I'll jump in first on that one and, and then I'm sure Tim will um, follow up with some additional comments. So the, the simple, the simple fact is that we have to make decisions now for things that are months ahead. Because uh, as I said earlier, you have to sign contracts with people, you have to bring in staff to deliver programming, you have to you know, take money from the community if they're signing up for programs. And then when that doesn't happen, when that program doesn't happen, uh, you've spent all the money, uh, you have to refund it, of course, uh, we will, and we have uh, done that for programs that have already been cancelled, uh, but you, you leave people in a state of uncertainty, and I think one of the most challenging parts of this crisis is that we don't know when it will be over. What we heard from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Health for Canada on Sunday was, uh, and these are direct quotes, uh, Canada, get ready for a long haul. And this is many, many months. So we, uh, you know, we were looking at our own internal planning in terms of what would be most prudent. And we felt that if that we shouldn't be spending money on programming that most likely best, best guess that we have based on the medical experts and advice that we're getting is that this is many months uh, in front of us still the peak of, uh, of people contracting the virus. We have not seen that yet. We haven't hit the peak yet. That's still two to three weeks out. So, uh, so we know that, that we have still a lot of, um, uh, of this in front of us. And so we didn't feel that it was financially prudent for the community to be spending money and to leave our community and our staff in a state of uncertainty. You know, we could have, I suppose, said uh, we're closed until further notice. That could be two hours, two days, two weeks, or two months. And the business community, uh, you know, needs to plan. Our community partners need to plan. And we need to budget and we need to give some certainty to our staff and our programs. So we, um, our best case scenario is that we're going to still be in this crisis by the end of June. Um, if we are done sooner, we will absolutely open the, open the doors. We're going to have a huge community party, by the way. So <laughs> when we can all come together and I can see you in person uh, and talk to you in person, we are so looking forward to that day. But until then, we have to plan. We have to budget very, very carefully. We have to give some certainty to our community. And so I know it sounds harsh uh, and a very long time frame. Toronto, as people probably know, did that a day or two ago. They've cancelled all of their uh, programming, festivals, events, spring programming right till the end of June too. So they're seeing the same information we're seeing. And uh, as I said earlier, the business community has not been ordered by the province to stay closed that long. They've extended it for two weeks. Um, and it's kind of week to week, but I know how much all of us are struggling or we're struggling with that day to day planning. So uh, we can't go day to day and hour to hour anymore. And uh, so we made that decision. I certainly stand by it and I know it's tough. Uh, and the key message is the longer we stay apart now, the sooner we can come together. Thank you. I could just add uh, just a couple things. I won't repeat anything the mayor said. I think she did a great job of why we chose that time frame. But you know, this is a very dynamic situation. And when you're in that kind of a situation, you have to make your best assumptions and you have to do it on the basis of 
you know, the information you get. We're not health experts at the city, but we do certainly have access to the region and, you know, Ontario, Canada. So I think we saw the writing on the wall that this is not something that we should make be making a decision a month for, you know, and so we have staff like school crossing guards, as an example, you know, they're a fundamental part of how we deliver services. You know, we need to be clear with a, a group like that about what their plans are. We have enormous amount of part-time staff. We have over 700 part-time staff. So the decisions we made this week now are being implemented. And quite frankly, it, it is dealing with us reducing our workforce. So when we do that, we want to have a time frame that I think gives everybody an opportunity to try to position themselves best to move on. And so the other thing that was kind of converging at the same time, as everybody knows, is the federal, uh, particularly the federal employment income relief program. So, you know, this is all sort of, uh, you know, a, a mix of, of things coming together and we make our assumptions, but what we wanted to do was really make decisions, I think, that are in the best interest. First of all, the community, which I think we, you know, in terms of how we've managed our facilities and parks and all of that, but also in terms of our employees. And so I think this was how we thought, I think going forward would give the best certainty and stability for moving ahead. Great, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> and our next question is related to some of what you just discussed about there. But what will be the economic impact of this for the city and in particular on the city and the region's budget? And if I could ask Mayor Mead Ward and Tim to comment on that first, and then John can speak for the region. Thanks. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick it off. The, I, I mentioned earlier the revenue loss from transit every day is significant. We're the free parking. Uh, that is uh, obviously a revenue loss for us. All of our programming that we've done, another revenue loss. At the same time, we have, we have essentially the same expenditures because most of our staff are engaged in uh, frontline services. So our fire department, our roads and parks maintenance, we have to keep, uh, keep the city in a state of good repair. We still are you know, picking up garbage in parks, uh, same at the region. We, we have community planning, uh, as you heard earlier from Heather, they're going to continue uh, their role. We have bylaw enforcement. You think about all the line items of service that we deliver uh, all of those staff are working uh, in many cases where we are able to, to assist them with technology they are working at home and so we have the same costs right now with uh, with not the same revenue so we are going to get a, a picture of what that looks like at our April 20th uh, council meeting and then we will be having to make some tough decisions about are there any uh, capital projects that we could uh, defer or delay a year until the revenue picture looks a little different but every municipality uh, e well every government is in the situation of uh, money still having to be spent while the revenue picture has dried up it's, it's really the same situation as all of the businesses that are out there. Yeah, I, again, I think the mayor covered it really well. I think what I would just add is, um, so on April the 20th, I think we'll, we'll paint the picture of, you know, what we've seen. I think the discussion about the impact, the financial impact will carry on probably through May, because as we go further, we get better information about the duration of the emergency and that. Uh, I do I think that, you know, we have, we do have some tools and, but it will involve reducing expenditures, potentially utilizing reserves. I mean, we do have reserves that, you know, are, are typically, not used in a, in a, you know, like a lump sum way, but we may have to require, you know, looking at how we go forward. And it, that'll depend on more difficult, I think it will be from a financial, but we're on it. Uh, we've got a great team in our finance department and we'll start that discussion with council on the 20th. Great, thank you, Tim. John, did you have anything to add for the region? Yeah, it's certainly going to be an interesting um, 2021 budget process. Um, we, we still are planning to bring our budget directions to Council in July. Uh, hopefully that will be an in-person meeting, but one never knows. So I think, you know, the region's um, overall cash uh, reserves are, are, are relatively healthy right now. So that's 
So, you know, we, we talked earlier about um, the tax remittance coming from a local municipality such as Burlington. Um, that's 60 days that, that will have some impact on our investment income, but um, we're probably not going to make, make much money there anyway in, this, in the current uh, circumstances. So um, the region, uh, you know, it's, it's a slightly different um, uh, makeup in terms of our revenue sources um, with, uh, with uh, provincial subsidies being a much larger uh, component. I know in Burlington, probably um, 65% of revenue comes from property tax. That's, that's a smaller amount at the region. So we have a, a slightly more diverse um, uh, revenue base, but uh, you know, certainly the, uh, the economic implications of this um, of, of COVID-19, they're, they're gonna be, they're gonna be uh, going into our 2021 uh, budget. So we'll be, uh, our finance group is looking at, at the various scenarios for us, but uh, um, Clearly, we see public health um, is, is really important for us. And I just wanted to maybe go back to that earlier question around essential services. Um, I know our management committee uh, is meeting today and we're you know, continuing to revisit um, you know, what are important services or business critical services, as Tim had put it, versus essential services. So um, if things continue to unfold and we need more support for public health, um, you know, we could look at the prospect of redeployment of staff um, in order to support the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic situation. So those are some of the things that the, the region's looking at in real time right now. Uh, but certainly we're, um, you know, we're all, uh, you know, looking at this uh, with, with concern in terms of uh, finances, but overall the region's um, fiscal position is healthy as we speak. Great, thanks, John. And uh, Tim had briefly mentioned there the April 20th meeting. So to clarify for everyone on the line, that's the April 20th meeting of council where there'll be reports coming forward um, on kind of business impacts from both uh, Team Burlington as well as city business impacts and then discussions around how they move forward on this. Uh, you can tune into that uh, live through the city system and you just go to burlington.ca and then the calendar to bring that up. Team Burlington, of course, will be attending and presenting at that meeting and we will put together a summary of any relevant business outcomes and get that out to our business community ASAP. So handing over to Carla to do our final set of questions and then close things up. Yes, um, I, I do have some additional questions for the city and region, but Dr. Kalina, I'm very mindful of your time. I know that uh, you have another commitment, so we don't want to detain you. Are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with everyone that's participating today so that um, any, anything further that you'd like to add just so that we can free up a few minutes for you? Thanks, Carla. I really do appreciate that. I, uh, I in fact, have a virtual clinic that I have to get back to after this. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is to make sure um, that we all remember how important it is to take care of one another and that uh, can be seen in a number of different ways. And that's not only supporting um, your neighbors uh, from a distance, of course, um, and supporting uh, your employees and ensuring that everybody remains safe as, uh, and healthy as well. Um, I think making sure that we reach out to one another in terms of asking uh, if people are having symptoms and knowing the people, right, sorry, the right people to, to talk to if there are symptoms, I think that's very important. And uh, just to reiterate, if you are feeling symptomatic uh, of any respiratory tract infection especially, it is very important to isolate yourself. And that does unfortunately mean no going out into public spaces, not, no going out for walks in the park. I, I know that it's a beautiful day today and, and I'm really sorry about that, but it is important to stay isolated. If you're just uh, social distancing or physical distancing, I think we're calling it now. You can go outside for walks and I think that that's a great idea, but it is important to stay six feet away from one another because we really want to prevent the spread of further infections. Um, the reason why that's so important is that although everybody will have seen, I think, in the news over the course of the past few days, at Joe Brandt, we're preparing for a large surge of patients. We're developing a pandemic response unit uh, to help with that, but really we would like to be uh, in a situation where we're overprepared. And the way that everybody um, can help prepare, help us prepare for that is by staying in, uh, by working from home, by social distancing, and by reaching out if you are feeling unwell. Um, the, I know that there's been a lot of kind of uh, war metaphors about uh, us as physicians and healthcare workers being on the front lines, but really, it's you that are on the front lines. 
And really, we're the last line of defense. And the best thing to, that you can all do is help us by uh, staying away from one another and supporting everybody. Thank you, Dr. Kalina. We, again, are so grateful to you and to your team and everyone at Joe Brandt for all that you're doing. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. I will leave, but I really appreciate it. If there are any other questions, uh, the uh, donations line, uh, believe me, they'll forward me the email too. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Take good care. Bye-bye. So um, I, I do have a, a question for both the city and the region. Uh, in hearing from our counterparts at the provincial and federal levels, um, there's much mention being made of the fact that everything is on the table in terms of what those two senior levels of government are looking at from a, a relief perspective, different measures that they may very well implement. Municipalities, however, are a bit more constrained. Uh, you're creatures of the province. You don't have unfettered latitude to target and, and create relief programs at your discretion. Are there other things beyond that very helpful and much needed property tax relief that you're currently looking at um, or considering or potentially contemplating asking the province to do in order to give you some flexibility to help businesses through this very challenging time as well as the recovery phase? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. We One of the strongest uh, roles that a municipality can play when we don't have legislative authority is to use our megaphone, our voice, and to advocate. And so we certainly have done that through the uh, Large Urban Mayors Caucus of Ontario, which is mayors from municipalities in Ontario that are 100,000 population or more. Three of the Halton Region municipality mayors sit on that group. And so throughout this process, LUMCO has been uh, active and vocal with the province to advocate for a range of reliefs and support. Uh, one of the most recent, which we haven't touched on yet, but uh, folks will probably know about is the hydro rates. So uh, the, o the Ontario Energy Board is the only one that can change the rates. They heard from all of the municipalities and many residents and businesses that there needed to be an, an off-peak rate or some relief. And so that was provided. It's, a, it's not the exact off-peak uh, that we're used to, but it's a blended rate of the, the higher and, and mid and low peak rates. So, so we, will, uh, we will continue to advocate for, for those measures. Uh, you're right, um, Carla, that we don't have the ability or the flexibility to fund those programs. Uh, in fact, we'll be looking for some relief ourselves from the province and the federal government just because of the, the scenario that I described earlier where we have expenditures that we have to make for uh, business continu continuity, for infrastructure uh, repair and maintenance and, and those items that are in our wheelhouse and we will need some support. So for example, if we have uh, city employees that are laid off, uh, they will be eligible for those programs too. So we are just as interested in how our own employees are being taken care of as the business community is interested in how your employees and how you are being taken care of. Thank you. Tim, do you have anything to add or? No, I, I think the mayor covered it well, so. Thank you. John, would you like to, is there anything else that the region is contemplating at this point or advocating for actively? Yeah, thanks, Carla, for the question. I think the, um, you know, certainly coming out of the council, regional council meeting we had on March 25th, I think there was a good conversation uh, with council virtually about um, other aspects of where the region can show uh, flexibility, that financial flexibility. So I think one of the things our finance group is looking at right now quite actively um, is with respect to um, water bills, the uh, consolidated hydro uh, bill that uh, goes out through the um, the LDCs, uh, the Burlington Hydro. Um, so that is a conversation. I, I believe some recommendations are going to be going internally um, in terms of what we can do there. Um, will, the, will that be the same way that we've seen um, uh, the region play that, that 60 day rule with respect to the tax remittance? So I think that's probably one of the key um, things that's being looked at uh, internally right now. Okay, thank you so much. So we've reached 11 a.m. and I'm very mindful of the fact that many on the line have other commitments. So uh, before we close, are there any final thoughts uh, that any of our panelists would like to share? And I'll maybe, I'll just sort of do a, a rapid fire. Mayor, anything further that you'd like to add? Messages for the business community? 
Sure. Uh, just to just to say thank you. I know it's really, really tough times. I do believe that we will get through this. And I, um, I would just ask everyone to follow the advice of our public health officials in your workplace, in your home. The sooner we, uh, we are able to, to knock this uh, virus back, to you know, kick it to the curb, the sooner we can come together. So we will be looking for business supports ourselves, uh, probably as we hit the peak. And we know that you are standing by and standing at the ready for that call. So thank you. Thank you. Tim, any final thoughts? I would just say, I think, you know, working through Team Burlington, that we're very conscious of the impact this will have, particularly on small businesses, you know, whether it's downtown or across all of the different sort of, you know, neighborhoods. Um, so I think we're going to be very flexible and we're going to want to hear, you know, what can we do to help? And I think that's, you know, that's why we're here because I think those businesses, you know, as well as all the other businesses are the ones that really define our ourselves as a community and, and that so it's really important i think that we get back you know to where we were thank you john anything further you'd like to add yes for all those businesses keep on keeping on i know there's so much information that's out there um it's really easy for all of us to um get uh, deluged by it all um so that's where team burlington is there and the region wants to to help out as well with our local partners um to help decipher that information in terms of all the programs that are out there um, you know Ontario announced a new program uh, on the procurement side um, just just yesterday. So helping local businesses decipher what's what's real, where to go, what's point us in the right direction, and certainly the April sixth uh, session that you guys are doing um, is going to go right down that road. But I think that's where we can um, we we can really help out a lot in terms of getting um, businesses to the right people and helping them through that process because um, it often is. Uh, not quite as easy as, as possible uh, to, to get uh, to get through some of these programs. So um, that's where I think we can uh, we can lend a hand. So really looking forward to uh, a whole lot of buying local as well as soon as we uh, as soon as we can. So to all those small businesses, um, also reach out to us at uh, at, at the region for uh, for small business um, support advice, and uh, we're there as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. Heather, any closing remarks? Oh yes, just a to thank the uh, small businesses for your patience uh, when we are working at um, issuing permits that you require. Uh, we will be doing everything and continue to do everything we can to uh, make that process um, as seamless as possible for you. Um, and also just to call out to uh, please feel free to help us. We've heard today how much physical distancing is important. And uh, as of today, calls can be made to the Halton Region Police um, non-emergency line. And our bylaw enforcement officers will be assisting police in responding to those. So anything that you see uh, through your um, operations that you feel should be reported, please do so. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And thanks to all of you for joining us uh, today, both as attendees as well as panelists. We can't thank you enough for your leadership that's being shown. Uh, very, very appreciated. And you know, certainly on behalf of Team Burlington, we are, we are truly grateful for your support and for the opportunity to collaborate and work together and support the business community during this unprecedented time. Uh, just a reminder that the Team Burlington website, which is a landing page that can be found at burlingtonchamber.com, uh, remains available to any business within the city and beyond. It is that one-stop shop, one version of the true source of information, resources, and tools. So please encourage everyone to use that resource and to reference it frequently and regularly. It's being updated on a daily basis. Part two of our business forum series is going to occur on this coming Monday at 10 a.m. We're delighted that we have both representatives of provincial as well as federal parliament joining us to answer questions. As we noted earlier in the, car, in the call, we've got you know, different levels of government, all of whom are very actively engaged in providing relief based on their jurisdiction to support the business community. So this is a key opportunity to build on the learnings and the wisdom that's been shared today 
and to understand what both the province and the federal government are doing in order to support the business community. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. A recording of this session will also be posted to our Team Burlington website, again, available at burlingtonchamber.com. And we will look forward to bringing further updates to the community in the near, the near future. So thank you again to all of our panelists and for everyone for joining us today. Take good care. Thank you, Carla. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, everyone.